I'm really excited to tell you all about some new landscaping resources for North Carolina's coastal region. I know we have a mixed audience. We have landscaping professionals, master gardeners, extension staff, and folks that are simply interested in this topic. Although one of the goals of the presentation is to share ideas that you can implement in your yard, another goal is that you share this information with your neighbors, clients, and community. At the end of the presentation, you will be able to fill out a request form to receive this PowerPoint and notes. Um, that way, if you want to deliver the presentation yourself, if you're comfortable with this subject matter, um, you may go forth and do so. Okay, so who am I? Like I said, my name is Jane Harrison. I work for North Carolina Sea Grant. Our organization conducts research, outreach, and education on coastal and marine issues. Um, you can see me there in the bottom right. I have a PhD in forestry, but focus my work on environmental social science. That is the human dimensions of environmental issues. I'm interested in what motivates people to take environmental action and how to reduce barriers to protecting our natural resources. I am joined today by Christy Perrin, who works for the North Carolina Water Resources Research Institute. Christy, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, as Jane said, I work for the Water Resources Research Institute, and I also put some time towards North Carolina Sea Grant. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been involved with watershed management in some form or another, watershed planning or implementing watershed plans, um, engaging communities and protecting their natural resources. And a lot of that is also involved managing stormwater um, through things like rain gardens and cisterns. And you'll hear a little bit about that from me later. So I'm um, looking forward to talking with you. So this presentation is really driven by one question, and here it is. How can we increase nature enhancing landscaping in coastal communities with easy, available, affordable, and attractive solutions? We're going to tell you about some of the solutions that you can implement in your yard. First, though, let's just chat about some of the yards that we see in our coastal neighborhoods. Okay, so this is a home near Newburn. I'd like to hear what you notice about this yard. Is there anything that you like in terms of their landscaping? Anything you dislike or think could be improved? And I want you to think about it from an environmental standpoint. So if you can just let us know, you know, what do you see in this yard here? You can actually just uh, communicate with us via the Zoom chat. Um, we'd just like to hear from you all a little bit about what you see in this yard. What do you observe in their landscaping? Okay, so we heard no buffer zone, um, ugly seawall that blocks wildlife access, a lot of turf. Hmm. Someone likes the trees. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no shrubbery. No plants. Yeah, I think you all are, are getting the picture. Uh, this yard is landscaped, uh, you know, with turf grass, pretty common. There's a hardened shoreline. Um, someone said everything is mowed short. Yep. Um, so that hardened shoreline, you know, we also know that as a bulkhead or a barrier wall. And basically that means that there's no connection between land and water. And I wonder if this photo reminds you of any yards that you see in your own neighborhood. Um, but let's go to another home and think about what you see here. Check out this next photo, this next slide. Um, this is a home near Wilmington. Now, how is this yard different from the one in the previous photo? Do you like this one better? Do you prefer the earlier photo? Um, is there anything that you think could be improved? What do you see from an environmental standpoint here? Please uh, uh, let us know in the Zoom chat. Okay. 
Let's catch water runoff, living shoreline, nice shoreline buffer, nice flow, no large trees, wildlife cover, not much shade. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, good mix. Um, you know, we do see some turf grass in this photo. There are some natural areas, though, as well. So someone said, I think I'm seeing natives in a buffer, as well as plant diversity. That's good for wildlife. Um, you also see land actually needing water here. So this homeowner actually went beyond turf and decided to add a perennial flower bed uh, to serve as a pond buffer. Now, water Front plants like this help protect water quality. They also act like a filter and a sponge to remove, transform, and store nutrients and other pollutants. Um, in addition, they do provide some shade, which moderates water temperature and certainly creating habitat for wildlife. So our hope is that you see more yards like this in your neighborhoods. Um, and you know, there's always more room to go, but in comparison to that previous photo, you can see that there are some improvements here, certainly from an environmental standpoint. So in this presentation, we're really going to talk about how to create this kind of yard and why it's desirable. But first, here is a little background about North Carolina's coast. Now, this is a map that shows the river basins of the state that flow to the coast. Now, we would like to know if you live in one of these. And if so, that means you live in a coastal watershed. Christy is going to launch a pole. And if you live in one of these river basins that drains into the coast, please let us know. If you don't, you can just click other. Put a, a minute here for people to respond to the poll. Half of you have responded. We'll wait just a few more moments. Again, if you don't live in one of these river basins, just click other. All right, your last chance. Probably good. Yeah, so you can see the results there. The majority of you looks like you're uh, coming from the Cape Fear River Basin. So my guess is you might be down in the Wilmington area. Um, we also have some folks from the Noose River Basin. So um, whether you're in Raleigh or perhaps you're down in New Bern, Moorhead City area. Um, got a couple folks from Pascatank, so maybe up near Elizabeth City. Um, Roanoke River Basin, Tar Pamlico, oh, some in White Oak that could be near um, Swansboro, um, and then a number from some other areas as well. Okay, great. Um, so though uh, one of the unfortunate things about living in these coastal watersheds is that our human activities do not always enhance the nature around us. Um, and unfortunately, many of our homes and residences, businesses, have adverse impacts on wildlife habitat and water quality downstream. Population growth associated with poor site development and landscaping practices often results in habitat loss and reduced water quality. Now, one of the special things about North Carolina is that it is home to more than 12,000 miles of shoreline, coastal shoreline. And along that shoreline are hundreds of creeks that foster species diversity. Creeks, along with marshes, serve as many estuaries, providing nursery habitat and feeding grounds for fish, shellfish, and wading birds. So you all are part of this presentation today with my hope that you will meet the coastal landscape challenge. Our coastal population is growing. So what we're seeing in response is that forested and agricultural areas are being converted to housing, transportation infrastructure, shopping centers, resorts, industrial sites, and certainly this kind of development can damage ecological systems by destroying habitat and altering hydrologic systems. This nature disconnect also harms people. 
Many studies have shown that time spent in nature improves our physical, mental, and psychological well-being. So again, going back to the really driving question in this presentation is how can we design our landscapes so that they contribute to the productivity, biodiversity, and ecological functioning of coastal ecosystems? And then how do we connect our families and neighborhoods to the natural world so that we're happier and healthier? And one solution is through sustainable coastal landscaping practices. So this is just an image of what some of those practices might look like. Um, you know, we can all work together to improve the coastal landscape and at the same time invest in our health and well-being. We can make changes to our landscapes that provide food and homes for pollinators and birds. We can reduce stormwater runoff that causes flooding and still provide inviting outdoor spaces that our families can enjoy. So what I'll say to all of us is let's preserve the coastal environment for the next generation, like these kids, and enjoy it ourselves. All right, so Christy and I are gonna get into the nitty gritty of what we mean by a sustainable coastal landscape. And so when we're thinking of nature enhancing landscaping, you know, my mind very quickly goes to sustainability. And the way that we're defining this is really a landscape that's attractive, environmentally friendly, well adapted to the local region, so the coastal region, storm ready, functional, functional and enjoyable, and cost efficient and manageable. So research has shown that our landscaping choices are frequently based on what we think others like. So thus, our landscaping choices really, you know, ought to be attractive to those other people Otherwise, they may not be maintained. And environmentally friendly or nature enhancing landscaping means that our choices should consider other creatures, so not just humans around us. Creating wildlife habitat via landscaping means we will be more likely to hear songbirds and observe butterflies in our yard. Landscaping choices that are well adapted to the coastal region means that we consider the sunlight, temperatures, precipitation, hydrology, salts, and soils of the coastal region. So really key pieces of knowledge for any gardener. Coastal landscapes that are storm ready allow us to protect our homes and avoid damages from hurricanes. If our landscaping choices are functional for what we like to do outside our homes, we're more likely to enjoy and maintain them. And finally, landscape choices must be cost efficient and manageable Otherwise, only a small segment of the population can implement or benefit. Now, does anyone know what the flowers are in this photo? If you do, please type your response in the chat box, or if you have a guess. Yeah. Anyone have an idea here? Okay, we've got an aster. Yes, it is an aster. Anyone know what kind of aster? All right, I'll tell you, it is an aromatic aster. Um, the genus and species, Symphiotrichum oblongifolium, and it's the cultivar October Skies. Um, anyone know the butterfly? Uh, this is an American lady butterfly enjoying the asters, and many species of aster are native to the coastal region. And really planting native species is just one example of a sustainable coastal landscaping practice. So we're really gonna get into some specific ideas for what you can do as a coastal resident or a leader in your community to improve the yards and neighborhoods where you live. We're gonna go through a number of ideas. So what I want you to realize though, before we give you this list, is no matter where you are, just start somewhere. Do what you can do. Every small action you can take on your property or in your neighborhood helps to provide a sustainable landscape. So the woman on the left, she is a resident of the town of St. James. Um, this is her yard, her backyard, and she knew she wanted to see birds and pollinators. So instead of planting grass, she decided to spread a packet of wildflower seeds. Now that was 14 years ago, 
Today, her yard is a mix of native plants, at least 50%, that appeal to local birds and butterflies. She also doesn't use any chemical weed killers. She has a rain barrel to supplement her watering, and she supports bluebirds with a house for nesting. She's created a haven for people and wildlife that's not the typical lawn with foundation shrubs, and people often driving by, they stop to admire it. Now the woman on the right is from Wilmington and she decided to install a backyard rain garden at her home. Her goal was to divert stormwater runoff and avoid pooling water. The rain garden accomplishes this by slowing the runoff and allowing the water to percolate into the soil. Both these women had the interest and the willingness to put some time into their yards. You may not have the same amount of time or resources, but we want to share a range of ways that you can contribute. So this is recommendation number one, and it's something if you're a master gardener or in the know, I'm guessing you're aware of. Choose native and non-invasive plants well suited to coastal conditions. Native plants play a critical role in coastal landscaping. For one, wildlife relies on native plants for food and shelter. Also, native plants are well adapted to the harsh conditions of the coastal region, so they generally don't require a lot of watering or fertilizer. Now, shrubs and trees native to the coastal environment are more likely to withstand the effects of storms because they're resistant to wind and floods. When selecting native plants, you can choose species of different types, different heights, blooming times. The assortment will benefit both plant and animal communities. Now, one example of a native coastal North Carolina plant is the seashore mallow. Maybe you've seen this perennial in brackish or even freshwater marshes. One reason the species is an attractive addition to a yard is that it has a long bloom period. So that can extend from May into October. Seashore mallows also attract pollinators like butterflies and other insects, as well as ruby-throated hummingbirds and even lizards. You might be wondering about non-native plants and whether they're okay to use. Some non-natives are very well adapted to the coastal environment. So really picking a plant regardless of origin that flourishes in this climate will certainly reduce the need for excessive watering or fertilizer. But regardless, you need to avoid invasive species. So these are often non-native species that threaten existing native plant communities and the wildlife that depends on them. So examples, you know, Chinese privet, English ivy, you see them all over. They're not things that you want to add to your yard. So we're going to just go through a few examples of some native and invasive uh, plants. I want to see your all's knowledge here. Um, Christy is working to launch a uh, poll for us. So let's see if we can get to it. And the question for you all is, can you identify the native tree? I think it's this other piece. And so you're going to look at these two. We have Loblolly Bay, which is Ordonia lassiananthus. And then we have Mimosa, Albizia juabrisin. Um, and so this poll is about to launch. Um, no, you're all good. We're learning, learning how this webinar works. Let me check out here. Okay. To the okay. All right. Now you have the poll. Can you identify the native tree? Can you see the picture? No picture. Okay. So, yeah. So, all right. I think most of you knew immediately that mimosa is not native to the coastal region or our state. And yet you're much more likely to see it in your neighbor's yard than the Loblolly Bay. Mimosa is considered an invasive in the Southeast. It commonly advances from the garden to natural habitats. It produces shoots from root sprouts, 
allowing it to form dense thickets, which prevents native plants from growing. Alternatives you may want to consider are the native red buckeye and the eastern red bud. Christy, were you able to show them the poll results? Just gonna shoot this here. One moment all, thank you for your patience as we learn this. Okay, hopefully you can see the results. Um, most of you could see there that it was the Loblolly Bay. We'll just have to go back and forth. And yeah, okay. so we'll just, if you could just let us know if you can see the picture. I am just gonna go back to, to escape to see that. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, I'm just gonna go back. I'm gonna ask if you can answer what you're seeing right now. Oh, okay, so someone says I can't see any pictures. So let's go to share. Nothing. Here and then share our screen. So there, that's the one. Okay, somehow. All right, it's back. <laughs> Hopefully it's back. So here we go. And stop sharing results. Okay, I'm gonna keep talking while Christy makes sure everything's good in the Zoom. Just let us know if you can see the presentation. I think folks can now. So maybe check in the chat box. The Loblolly Bay, which you may be less familiar with in regards to landscaping, is a flowering broadleaf evergreen tree common in Pocosin or wetland bogs, swamp forests, and wet pine savannas. Loblolly Bay is important to Carolina Bay wetland ecosystems, which are unique geological formations with an elliptical shape that are often seen in eastern North Carolina. It provides cover to wildlife during winter and extreme weather. Okay, we are going to go to the next uh, poll. And so can you identify the native bush? So we've got thorny olive, Iliagnus pungens, and we have Yopon holly, Elex fomatoria. Which one is native? Yeah, back in business. I think everyone's seeing, <laughs> seeing the PowerPoint. Good. Okay, so um, we're going to end the polling. I think we've got a good sense that you all are a pretty educated bunch. Thorny olive is indeed an invasive shrub spread by bird dispersed seeds. Good alternatives are yopon and high bush blueberry. Yopon holly, for example, is an evergreen shrub or small tree native to sandy woods, brackish and tidal marsh shorelines dunes, maritime forests, and shrub thickets. Its white, fragrant flowers give way to red berries that provide sustenance to songbirds and small mammals. Okay, this is your final uh, quiz on native and invasive plants. I think you're all gonna get this one. Can you identify the native vine? We have Japanese honeysuckle, Lonicera haponica, and coral honeysuckle, Lonicera sempervirens. Okay, so I think you all are definitely getting this one. Christy will show us in the results here. Um, Japanese honeysuckle is a common invasive plant in the southeast. It colonizes by prolific vine growth and seeds that are spread by birds. The plant forms evergreen mats which shade out native vegetation and climb up small trees and shrubs. Good native alternatives are Carolina jessamine, coral honeysuckle, and cross vine. Coral honeysuckle, for example, is a fast-growing semi-evergreen vine that twines along the margins of maritime forests and maritime shrub thickets. It's a larval host to the hummingbird clearwing moth. Various songbirds, including cedar waxwings, catbirds, and cardinals, feed on its round red berries, and hummingbirds seek its nectar. Okay, so I'm going to turn over the presentation now to Christy, and she's going to get into a few more of our recommendations for coastal landscaping. So one thing you can do is use a mix of plant types in your yard, trees, shrubs, grasses, vines, and flowering perennials, which are the plants that come back every year. This results in a varied vegetation structure. So by varied, I mean different layers of vegetation. So you have ground cover, shrubs, 
medium trees and tall trees like you see in this um, picture. So why is this varied vegetation important? Anyone? I was asking for a chat, but that's okay. <laughs> it offers both ecological and health benefits. So for instance, the larger vegetation, the trees help keep things cool. Much of the plants take in carbon dioxide, plus the varied plant layers provide habitat for various animals, including birds and insects that control other plant pests. So the varied vegetation also improves the quality of groundwater and surface water. So let's get to lawns. So lawns are typically one non-native species of turf grass, which doesn't do much for wildlife. So you could consider lawn alternatives like ground covers. Ferns, for example, provide foraging space and shelter for ground feeding birds, while other critters like frogs and turtles like to hide in them. And this is a cinnamon fern that you see in this picture. Ferns are great for shady spots, as is wild ginger, another ground cover option. And a sunny spot is great for flowering perennials that come back year after year, like Rebecca or what we also call black-eyed Susans. Native grasses, like pink muley grass, are another low-maintenance option. You can also reduce your lawn by expanding mulch around trees and flower beds. So most of us like a little grass under our feet. I know at our house, we use it for wiffle ball and soccer. Um, but so you can consider how your lawn can fit into a sustainable landscape. You can minimize turf grass to appropriate areas like relatively flat sites that get heavy usage and sun for at least four hours a day. You can allow your turf grass to go dormant during drought. It will come back. So if you're concerned about weeds popping up, um, remember that weeds what we think of as weeds, often provide important resources for pollinators like bees. So you could even mow at a little higher height and let some of those weeds grow and flower. If you do use a turf grass, consider a low input warm season grass that's well suited for the coastal environment. Centipede grass requires minimal fertilizer and low mowing frequency compared to Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass and zoysia grass. So reducing water and fertilizer um, use is another step towards sustainable landscaping. Try to water early in the morning so it doesn't evaporate as quickly. Also avoid light frequent watering. Strong and healthy plants have deep roots which require deep watering. So there's no hard and fast definition for what is meant by watering deeply, but it generally means that the water is able to soak at least eight inches below the soil surface. And the main point between, behind this is that most plants' roots are not sitting close to the soil surface. They've worked their way down into the soil in search of water and nutrients. And this helps protect the plant in times of drought because the soil surface will dry out much quicker than it will below ground where the soil is cooler. So watering deeply teaches the roots to reach deep into the soil for water. You can also wait to water grass until it shows signs of needing water. At that point, you could provide a half inch of water so that the roots are saturated. So you can think of it as giving your yard a half inch rainfall. To help you figure out how much is a half inch, you can set a can outside to catch water when you're, when you're watering. So for example, an empty tuna can is one inches tall. So you can figure out how long it takes to fill up half of that can. If you're using a rotor sprinkler, this may take 45 minutes to an hour. Spray sprinklers take about a third of the time, so 15 to 20 minutes. As for fertilizer, first test your soil to see what kind of nutrients your lawn actually needs. So by nutrients, I mean nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and the like. It may be that you won't have to apply anything depending on your soil quality. But if you do need fertilizer, be sure to apply it at the right time of year. Timing depends on the species of grass that you use. And whatever you do, don't apply fertilizer to frozen ground or dormant turf because then it won't get used. Also keep fertilizer off of paved surfaces. 
Otherwise, it'll run off your yard quickly and go into the storm drain system and your local waterways. So soil um, is really important for um, sustainable landscaping. Yards and newer residential developments often suffer from poor soil health. And why is that? Um, soil can get compacted by heavy equipment during development. So as a result, the soil structure breaks down and it can't hold much water. Soil pH, which is a marker of acidity, can also change when soil deteriorates. And compacted soil also contains fewer nutrients and less organic matter. So an example of organic matter is what's found in compost. And you can see a picture of that there. Specifically, it's residue that comes from a once living or living organism, organism and is often in a stage of decomposition. So organic matter increases water infiltration into the soil. This is really important. Um, it also improves soil's water holding capacity as well as its nutrient holding capacity. So if you look at the picture on the top right here, on the right here, it's uh, Elizabeth City Gardener that's making, who's making compost from his kitchen scraps to spread on his garden beds. So what should you do if you have a lawn but your soil needs resuscitation? You can try a technique called top dressing, which entails adding a thin layer of compost onto existing lawn. Top dressing your lawn with compost is a great way to enhance soil health, and healthier soil means less need for water and fertilizer. Compost top dressing has been done on golf courses for years and is becoming more common for home lawns. So to do this, the layer of compost should be spread no more than a quarter inch thick. And as I mentioned before, you want to know exactly what your soil pH is and whether nutrients are needed. And one thing that's really great to know is that between April and November, you can have your soil tested at no charge <laughs> via the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. So to have that done, you can contact your county extension office to learn more. Okay, so here's, here's where I spend a lot of my time thinking about um, managing stormwater to improve water quality. There's a lot you can do on your own property. So improving stormwater management is yet yeah, one more sustainable coastal landscaping technique. So the idea is to try to keep and use as much of the rainfall on your property as possible. So you'll conserve water as you use less to water your plants and contribute to reducing flooding downstream. There's a range of activities that reduce the amount of runoff that leaves the yard, which can then flow downstream and cause erosion, pollution, and flooding problems. Um, as you'll see in the picture on the top, on the left, using rain barrels or cisterns, which are much larger rain barrels, is one option. Another easy option is to direct the runoff from your downspouts, if you have any, towards planted areas rather than into ditches or the road where it will end up in your nearest water body. Some homeowners may even want to install rain gardens to allow even more water to infiltrate. So we saw a picture earlier in the presentation. Basically, a rain garden is a depressed landscape area in the yard that allows rainwater to soak in while removing pollution. The rain gardens are designed to release water downhill away from the home during larger rain events. So the photo on the left is a Wilmington resident who's using her rain bar barrel to water her plants. And the photo on the right is a youth service group proudly showing off a rain garden that they helped a homeowner, homeowner <laughs> install in Cary, North Carolina. So you've perhaps noticed that many neighborhoods have stormwater ponds and they can vary from unsightly to appealing. So does your neighborhood have a stormwater pond? Do you see any of these in your neighborhoods? And if you do, have you seen how it's functioning? Or maybe you wanna consider, <laughs> I see somebody saying yes. Um, you may wanna consider how it's functioning. Does it look the way you want it to do? So in this picture, this is a stormwater pond in Currituck County that was physically reconstructed to improve the quality of stormwater leaving the developed property. Soil was removed around the perimeter of the pond and plants were installed to create a shallow water wetland. 
native plants that look to me like tick seed perhaps were added along the shoreline to improve the pond's ability to remove pollutants. So what was once a rather unattractive pond now treats stormwater runoff, provides wildlife benefits, and is a whole lot nicer to look at. So you can create a better stormwater pond with some of the following techniques. First, perimeter plantings can be added. These are rings of native vegetation around the perimeter of the pond that can improve water quality, prevent shoreline erosion, provide wildlife habitat, and deter nuisance Canada geese. Floating treatment wetlands are another feature you can add. These wetlands typically consist of large plastic mats that float half above the water and half below it. Wetland plants like rushes, sedges, hibiscus, lizard's tail, and pickerel weeds are planted in the mesh and grow by taking nutrients from the stormwater pond. So these floating wetlands improve how the stormwater is treated. And they also provide wildlife habitat and add some beauty. And just to, to mention briefly, stormwater ponds that have been typically not designed to maintain or, or they usually not designed or maintained to reduce much stormwater pollution or flooding. So there's a lot that can be done to improve them. Another thing that can be done are to add wetland benches. These are shallow water wetlands that appear along the shoreline of the pond. They can increase the capacity of the stormwater pond to remove pollutants, which helps ensure the water discharge from the pond is cleaner. So construction of such a wetland bench in an existing pond requires grading equipment like a backhoe or an excavator, as well as an experienced contractor or equipment operator, and possibly permits from the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. So just be careful when you go about making these changes. <laughs> Um, it's important to also control unwanted plants. Not every plant is beneficial to a pond. So being vigilant about inspecting for and removing invasive and potentially harmful plants is one of the best ways to keep a pond attractive and functioning properly. Finally, you can use trails, signs, and routine maintenance to draw people to your pond and make it a neighborhood amenity. And I did see a comment, someone was asking if we're gonna cover recommended plants for rain gardens. Throughout this presentation, we're mentioning um, you know, plants here and there as examples, but at the end, you can actually request um, a few different resources from us. Um, and one of those is a list of, uh, we've got all kinds of great online educational resources you know, about rain gardens in particular and the plants that you could choose. Um, so make sure to fill out the request form at the end if you're looking for more detailed information about any particular topic. Okay, so again, this is Jane. I'm going to keep going with a few more recommendations for you all. Um, one of those is certainly to create storm-ready, resilient landscapes. And, you know, what we've seen, you know, in recent times since Hurricane Florence and more recently Hurricane Dorian, many coastal residents are rethinking the resilience of their landscapes. The coastal Carolinas are second only to Florida in the number of times they have been pummeled by hurricanes and nor'easters. And the intensity of hurricanes and nor'easters is increasing. Coastal storms are developing higher wind speeds, delivering more intense rainfalls, and driving higher storm surges ashore. Now this photo was taken near Swansboro just three months after Hurricane Florence. As you can see, there's not a lot of vegetation there. So we're gonna talk about some of the landscaping practices that can be used to better protect these properties. Okay, so one of those ideas is really to consider nature enhancing alternatives when replacing deteriorating bulkheads. For those who are looking to protect waterfront property, know that you have an alternative that can actually even do more to protect the shoreline. These living shorelines have been shown to outperform hard engineered shoreline stabilization structures during storms and are at a lower cost to repair. This photo here is a deteriorating bulkhead in Elizabeth City. The property to the right, you know, this is someone's front yard, floods often. So with this bulkhead needing replaced, why not look into some alternative options? And so one of those great alternatives, living shorelines, is you know, 
it is a good alternative because it maintains existing connections between upland, intertidal, and aquatic areas while providing shoreline erosion control. And again, observations after hurricanes indicate that living shorelines outperformed nearby bulkheads by dissipating wave energy and reducing shoreline erosion. So if you're wondering what exactly a living shoreline is, it's kind of what it sounds like. An area along the waterfront that's full of thriving vegetation, even native materials like oyster shells. They provide shoreline erosion control in addition to ecological benefits like protecting coastal salt marsh habitat for fish and crustaceans. This photo here shows volunteers placing bags of oyster shells to establish a living shoreline in Moorhead City. Living shorelines can also include planted salt marsh grasses. They maintain the natural slope of the land, which helps absorb waves as they roll up the shoreline. In addition to outperforming bulkheads, living shorelines have proven to be a longer term, less expensive option for waterfront property owners. Now recently it has become easier for homeowners to get a living shoreline permit. You need to check with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management to determine whether this is an option for you or your community. One of our final recommendations is to select storm ready trees to protect your home. We know there's been a lot of tree loss since these storms and a lot of people are preemptively removing trees in their neighborhood or near their homes. Um, and so it's important to know which plant species best survive storm events and thus you can install more storm resistant landscapes. Because of their size and longevity, trees and shrubs are especially of concern. These are just a few examples of native trees highly suited for storm events. And you can see some of the observations that have been found during storms. So the coastal American hornbeam is a great choice because of its hard, dense wood, the limbs resist breakage. It also has medium high wind resistance. Now, regardless of the species that you choose, trees growing closely together typically have an advantage. Trees with interlacing root systems are less likely to be uprooted than single specimens. And trees growing in clumps, that is not in a line, shield one another. This arrangement enhances their survival. In addition, clumps composed of a mixture of species endure powerful winds better than clumps of a single species. So I'll just give you a few more examples of some storm ready trees. Um, one favorite, the live oak certainly. Um, this has high wind resistance. Now wind may defoliate the tree, but with the deep roots, um, if it's in well-drained soil, you see that it certainly has a somewhat low profile. It tends to do pretty well. I actually had a call from a resident of Beaufort just the other day and he, when he was calling just to you know, tell me how great live oaks do and how he thinks they're the only tree that should be planted near the waterfront in Beaufort. Now, I might argue that there's a few more to try, um, but the live oak is certainly a great example. Um, and one thing is, I think, to, to tell your neighbors and to tell your friends who are feeling that kind of fear with, you know, every time storm season comes, um, they're thinking, oh, I might cut down all my trees or the trees near my house. Um, remind them that, you know, it's important to regularly inspect their trees for damage or disease, um, but if they are able to maintain their tree's health, they really are going to greatly reduce the likelihood of storm damage. Okay, and if you're looking for even more detail on storm-ready trees, I really would advocate that you check out um, Paul Hozier's book, um, this is Seacoast Plants of the Carolinas, particularly chapter seven on native vegetation and coastal storms. It'll tell you a lot about different species. That's where we got this information about trees to choose for storm events. Um, and another thing uh, to realize is this book is just a wonderful resource overall about native plants and invasive plants in the coastal region um, in our state. Okay, so our final recommendation before we get to some specific resources that we're going to share with you all is just to seek out expertise if you need help. I know it can be daunting to change your yard or to give your neighbors some advice, 
um, but there really are people who can help. So this presentation um, was actually created by the Coastal Landscapes Initiative. That's something that Christy and I participate in. And it's a partnership that brings together experts in landscape architecture, design and contracting, horticulture, science and business, ecology and wildlife, education and outreach. Now, some of the easiest experts and most knowledgeable ones to access are at your county's extension office. For example, Grace Manzer, pictured here, is the consumer horticulture agent in Pascatank County based in Elizabeth City. You can also connect with your local master gardeners to get your answers, uh, your questions answered. And like I said, we are going to provide a resource list on some particular topics for you. I'm going to highlight just some of those resources now. Okay, so if you haven't seen it already, one of the first products that the Coastal Landscapes Initiative created is this guide to coastal landscaping in the state. And it features 34 native plants ranging from trees, shrubs, and grasses to vines and flowers. And it includes brief descriptions about each one. It also offers information on the coastal conditions that each plant is most suitable for. The guide comes both as a booklet and a brochure for quick reference. And what I've been telling folks is you can keep this guide. This is something I think high quality enough to keep on your shelf, your bookshelf, your library at home, and then take that brochure with you when you visit your local nursery or garden center and tell them these are the plants that you wanna see. A big you know, part of making this change is increasing consumer demand for these landscaping resources as well as increasing supply from the landscaping industry. And I do want to say, you know, these guides, they're not exhaustive. Like I said, we only have 34 plants featured. There are many other wonderful native plants. I have people call me just to ask, why was my plant not in here, you know? And uh, it doesn't mean because we left it out that it's not a great plant, but this is a great place to start if you're looking to bring some natives to your yard or to realize maybe some that you're missing. Okay, so we also have some really wonderful design templates that are almost complete. Um, these are a series of design templates that you can use in your own coastal garden or yard. And so there's different types. Um, you can see some of these design templates using native plants um, for the foundation plants near a house for screening. Um, you can see some designs related to pollinator friendly borders, natural and constructed shorelines. So if you want to include a living shoreline, filter strips, and really they're easily adapted to suit unique site conditions. Designs range from naturalistic to more polished and tidy, and they're intended to help define edges and organize spaces in the yard. They also work well as standalone gardens. This is just a few examples of what those design templates look like. So just a few pieces that I put here. Um, this is a template that's um, uh, created to provide privacy screening. And really it's a you know, semi-evergreen border, which is a good choice for increasing privacy at your home or blocking an unsightly view year round. Now for several years, while the trees are still young, in this template they're suggesting sweet bay magnolia. You'll see perennial flowers planted at the base, so solidago and orange cone flower that will get plenty of sun to bloom throughout the spring, summer, and fall, attracting pollinators and other beneficial insects. In the fall and winter, birds will forage on the flower seeds. So in each of these templates, you'll see um, some suggested plants as well as some alternatives um, so that you can you know, have a variety to choose from. And I have just one more example of a design template. This is the filter strip. Um, and the idea um, is you would plant these plants to filter out sediment, pollutants, and nutrients from stormwater before it flows into a water body. Good locations include along ditches or swales, along the shore of a pond or at the top of a seawall. So you can see in each of these templates, we have the type of plant, the number in the design, as well as spacing and layout. The plans are color coded and labeled with dimensions. So you can see here in this design, we've included switchgrass, mooly grass, and sand coreopsis. Now you can find more resources like this 
Um, if you go to the next slide, Christy, there is our website. Please check out go.ncsu.edu uh, forward slash coastal landscapes. Um, and Christy, I wonder, could you put that in the Zoom chat? Just type that sure. out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's just um, where we're keeping all of our resources for the Coastal Landscape Initiative. I expect the design templates to be completed. Um, we'll see. Hopefully in the next few weeks, we're just putting the final touches on those. Those are going to be a wonderful resource. Um, another resource that we have developed, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, Christy, um, you can also go to this site, which is also linked to our Coastal Landscape site. Christy, would you put that in um, Zoom too, mm -hmm. Zoom chat box? So um, go.ncsu.edu forward slash model landscapes. If you're trying to get an idea of what kind of landscaping practices that we're talking about, what they look like, and you want to see them in the seasons in a real place and near your neighborhood, you can check out this map. And so what it does is identifies publicly accessible sites with sustainable landscaping features. For example, the North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island features a demonstration rain garden and native plant habitat garden. The town of Sunset Beach is developing a dune garden with over 50 species of native plants. If you're aware of a great example of publicly accessible sustainable coastal landscaping, you can submit the site details here. Just go to this website and you'll see in the top how to do so. Okay, so really our final question to you all is what will you do and what about your neighbors? This is that homeowner that we talked about earlier. Um, he lives in Wilmington or near Wilmington and he helped to organize his neighborhood's stormwater pond committee. So that was that house we saw that had the perennial flower bed. This is just a different viewpoint of it. And what he does is he actually provides information to his neighbors on how to keep stormwater ponds functioning and beautiful. This is that pond behind his house and it features many gorgeous native flowering perennials. If you want to see sustainable coastal landscaping become the norm in your community, there are a lot of things you can do. First, please share the coastal landscaping resources that we've talked about. Share them on community listservs, next door, Facebook groups, in person. You can participate also in neighborhood native plant buys and sales, or you could start one. If you're looking for a landscape designer or contractor, find someone with a proven commitment to sustainable landscaping. And once you find someone you like, pay it forward by sharing the recommendation with your neighbors. And certainly don't forget to have fun and celebrate successful landscaping projects in your neighborhood and community. You could give out an annual award for the most sustainable yard or green yard. And what if you belong to a homeowners association? You can help by reviewing covenants and promoting adoption of sustainable landscaping language. Also, encourage your HOAs to include native plants on allowable plant lists. Now, Christy is going to launch the last poll. Um, this is where we're going to find out just a little bit about your knowledge of these topics and uh, whether this presentation has uh, given you any ideas for new things you might want to do. Please go ahead and fill that out. Um, we are aware that the information we shared today was a refresher for many of you. And for others, though, you might have learned quite a bit. So we're hopeful to see that you can share this information with others. 